Hello, welcome, and thank you all for coming this evening. My name is Matt Schumann. I am part of the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, there are just a few things to mention. If you need an assisted listening device, they're available on the table to the side. After the talk is over, there will be a short Q&A where I can pass a microphone around. Um, this lecture is part of the Cary Library series on science and economics, brought to, you, brought to the library by George Burnell. George continues to enrich life in Lexington by bringing some of the stars of these fields to the library, and we're very grateful for his contributions. So please give a warm welcome to George Burnell. Say that. Say, say that for the next one. Uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, before we get started, I just want to tell you one thing. That there is a email list over here on this table. If you want to be on the notification list for this series, leave your email address on that, and I'll add you to the mailing list. Um, our speaker, Gary Gensler, a senior advisor to the uh, director of MIT Media Lab, senior lecturer for MIT Sloan, and Chairman of the Maryland Financial Consumer Protection Commission. Formerly, he was Chairman of the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, leading the Obama administration reform of the $400 trillion uh, swap, uh, swaps market. During the Clinton administration, he was Under Secretary of the Treasury for Domestic Finance and Assistant Secretary of, to the, of the Treasury. He was the Chief Financial Officer for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. Previously, Gensler was a partner at Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. including leading the fixed income and currency trading in Asia and serving as co-head of finance. He earned his MBA and BSc from the Wharton School, uh, University of Pennsylvania. He is a recipient of 2014 Tamar Frankel Fiduciary Prize. Gary joins us this evening to discuss blockchain technology in the world of crypto finance. Bitcoin may be the most well-known cryptocurrency, but there are others as well. Most of them are built on blockchain technology, but what does that mean? How do cryptocurrencies differ from or relate to money in our society? Please welcome a global expert on the financial phenomenon. Thank you, George, for that kind introduction. I thank the Cary Library for hosting this uh, talk. Um, it's a beautiful um, uh, venue you have here, and um, I think I'm going to have to stay a little longer and get a, check out a book if I can. But, um, so, it's your honorary library card. Oh, I do need that library card. <laughs> Don't check with Baltimore where I grew up. I'm not sure I returned all those books when I was a teenager. Um, so I thank you for getting all together uh, for this. Um, please interrupt me if you have a question. I teach at MIT, uh, and I find if it's a dialogue and a discussion, that's helpful as well. So don't hesitate. But can I do a little bit of just sort of context setting and ground setting? Can I ask in this audience, I ask this question anytime I speak about this, but. How many of you have actually purchased or owned Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency? Okay, okay, we've got four, four of you. We're not trying to out anybody on your taxes or anything like that. Um, um, uh, all right, so four. 
Now, when I teach at MIT, as students, it's about a half or 60%. So it's not, you know, it's MIT, of course, but so I'm just kind of gauging the audience and so forth. Um, so what we're gonna try to do, I'm gonna take you on a bit of a journey. I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey on six topics. Basically, uh, by the end, hopefully you feel a little conversant, a little bit crypto literate uh, uh, along this journey. But money, money, the payments riddle, and there's a gentleman that we'll talk about, Satoshi Nakamoto, which is at the, oh, there we go. All right, uh, is this working better? No. All right, uh, but money and the payments riddle that came along with the internet, and then Satoshi Nakamoto. Does anybody know who Satoshi Nakamoto is, by the way? Oh, all right, hold on a second. I'm gonna give you a, no, 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 no. Who's Satoshi Nakamoto? I don't think anyone knows. Oh, gosh. All right. I thought maybe we were gonna find out who Satoshi Nakamoto is. So nobody knows who Satoshi Nakamoto, you, you do? Craig Wilson. All right. The reason I ask for those who don't know, the so to speak inventor, we don't know who it is. But we'll get to Satoshi Nakamoto. So there's mystery in this story as well. There's economics, there's technology, there's riddles, there's mysteries, there's money. I mean, it's got almost everything to make a really interesting plot line. Um, crypto markets, what's generated, what's become of this broad thing, crypto markets. We're gonna talk about smart contracts and innovation and technology really of the 1990s uh, and how that's led to a new form of raising money called initial coin offerings. Fourthly, basically some ground truths about the economics. There's a lot of hype here and I'm gonna hopefully walk you through some of that hype. I am not a Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, if you wanted somebody that really believed wholeheartedly on all of this, you got the wrong speaker, George. All right, but I'm not also a minimalist. I'm not all the way over saying this is all hokum. So I'm gonna be somewhere in the middle to ground this. Discussions, we'll talk about how it's becoming a catalyst for change and then what a path forward. So that's the journey we're gonna to try to do. So first, money and the payments riddle. So first, the role of money. We all use it, right? What is it? It's a medium of exchange. Anthropologists, archeologists all talk about it. Economists talk about it. Uh, I give you money, you give me wheat or corn. But it's also a store of value because when I give you money for the wheat or corn, I'm talking thousands of years ago, you feel you can keep that and use it tomorrow to buy something uh, to tend to your fields. So it had to be a store value to have any value. I'm not talking about millions of dollars. I'm even saying that it had to explore the boundary of today I buy my corn, you take this and you can use it tomorrow to buy something else. And over time, in every community, it became a unit of account. That we think about things in dollars is not prescribed by God, it's not prescribed by law, it's pres prescribed by social consensus. We started thinking about it in terms of a unit of account. So medium of exchange, store of value, which deals with something called temporal economics. Today I buy something, you can take this and use it tomorrow. Uh, and then a unit of account. So it's kind of fun path, let's look back. Cowie shells in, in uh, Africa, in uh, West Africa. There's your coins. Tally sticks in England were used just to use a system of accounting. And my favorite, does anybody know about rye stones in the island of Yap? You do? <coughs> Why would you know about rye stones? You read a book. You read a good book. <laughs> There's, a one, there's wonderful stories about it, but in the Indonesian uh, chain, in the 19th century, the British showed up, and this was, these stones, by the way, are larger than humans. So you can't carry them around. They're not like pocket change. 
and they figured out that actually rye stones are more a system of accounting and credit and ledgers than they are about like the change we have in the pocket. Metal, we've had metal coins, copper, bronze, gold, silver, all of the like. And then of course, paper. So we've moved from like physical money to paper money. And China, we can thank China. Now we're not entirely sure when it first started. Paper money started with really pieces of paper that said you've stored your grain or wheat or gold in a warehouse. They were warehouse receipts. I'm talking seven, nine hundred years ago. If I had a warehouse receipt of gold and silver coin somewhere, well, of course, maybe somebody will take that as a medium of exchange, a store of value, or a unit of account. But over time, governments kind of got involved too and said maybe I'll issue paper money. And so we ended up with what we call fiat currency. Fiat currency, it's a made up concept. So when we get to Bitcoin and you say what stands behind Bitcoin, I will say remember what I said here, this is just a social construct as well. But fiat currency to be more technical, central bank notes. And I'm not particularly good with too many hands here, so this, this is going to go down for a second. Tell me what it says on the top. Federal Reserve Note. So it says Federal Reserve Note. You're, you're going to keep the five for a little bit. <laughs> Now, now, I don't know what country I just handed, but it's some foreign currency. Does it say anything similar? Bank National Switzer. Bank National Switzer. Yeah, so Bank National Switzerland. So similarities, one's the Central Bank of Switzerland, one's the Central Bank of the U.S. Those are pieces of paper, or more technically linen, even though we call them paper. A good Massachusetts company, by the way, is behind this, Crane. Crane Paper Company. Um, so Federal Reserve Bank notes, that's what we spend. But basically, we spend a lot more central bank reserves. We have bank deposits. If you walk into Starbucks and you buy something in Starbucks, how many people have used paper cash today? All right. About half. I asked that in a millennial audience. I don't want to age any of you. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty light in a millennial audience. You know, one out of a group this size, two out of a group this size. So they're not using paper. We use bank deposit money. When you go into Starbucks, you're asking your bank, Bank of America, to transfer a digital representation of money to Starbucks bank, let's call that JP Morgan. So we all the time use digital representations of money already. The third thing, uh, or that I did the third thing, central banks also take deposits from commercial banks. This form of money has tremendous network effects. You'll hear the term network effects about Facebook and Google. Google is 90 plus percent of the worldwide search, so Google has what's called network effects. Well, money has network effects, and why does that? Because we all accept it. It has no other value except for we know our neighbor will accept it. We know that it's socially acceptable. But when governments lose control of their finances, whether it's because they're spending so much or they go to war or their central banks lose control, then there's not a social consensus. Uh, a, 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 one of your audience members came up to me and said that she's from Venezuela, or maybe her family's from Venezuela. That's a country right now that's having challenges with their currency. But until the government really loses control of their finances, as Germany did in the 1930s, as China did in the late 1940s, usually we'll accept this stuff called fiat currency. So that's a little background. Does anybody know this scene from a movie? Anybody know who, oh, you know? Who is she? Sandra Bullock in the opening scene, very good, The Net. That's the opening scene of a 1995 movie. 
Now, it's a, it's a wonderful kind of B-level movie about a crime and cybersecurity and everything, but the opening scene, Sergio Bullock is trying to buy a pizza on PizzaNet. Pizza Hut in 1995, and they gloat about it now, was the first commercial use of the internet to sell something on the internet and actually accept money. Whether they were or weren't is a debate, but it's a good scene from a movie. The challenge was that the challenge was was the pizza was delivered and you had to pay money at the door. There was no way in 1995 to move money on the internet. When I say no way, there was literally no way. 1995 was the same year that Amazon was started, the same year that eBay was started, and yet there was no way to move money on the internet. So it was kind of a riddle. I call this the payments riddle. The internet comes along, nobody knows how to move money on the, on the internet. And so, how do you do it securely? How do you do it efficiently? How do you do it as a packet of data? That's how we move everything else on the internet, packets of data. And how do we do it to make sure that somebody doesn't double spend? Sir, if you gave this $5 to this a uh, young lady back here. It's hard for you to give it to anybody else. It's done. But in the internet, if you sent it digitally, the question was, what about double spending? You can send the same email to two parties. I'm watching you. I got it. <laughs> um, so here were some of the tries at it. There was multiple, we're not gonna go through them, but there were multiple ways, I <laughs> saw so that. There are multiple ways to try to do this, and every one of them failed. Everyone failed because they didn't solve the double spending, they were centralized, merchants didn't want to adopt it, and there's great, wonderful stories behind every one of these things. This is everything before Satoshi Nakamoto. David Chum, Alan Beck, all these kind of wonderful figures in cryptography. So instead what happened is the internet became secure. I don't know that any of you that didn't, you know, were to worry about this. This is the security level. Secure socket layer and transport layer security came out in 1996. And e has anyone used the internet today? Then every one of us used secure socket layer and transport layer security. It's a way that two websites can securely talk to each other and your communication stays private. And it's a little mathematical thing that messages get sent back and forth until a secure socket is established and we all trust it. We don't even know why. I don't know how my carburetor works in my car either, but we don't know why this works. But I'm telling you, Without that invention in 1996, the internet wouldn't have gone where it was. But that was the payment riddle, and it was solved. And then, you know, we accept Visa, American Express, and Discover is basically how we Americans largely solved the payment riddle. Now, PayPal came along in 1998. They tried to break in into the payment space. And then in other countries, in Scandinavia first, was the first to do mobile digital payments. It didn't really take off, but in China in 2003, Alipay started digital payments. Alipay is basically equivalent of their Amazon, if you wish, China's. Well, in China, people don't use their bank accounts as much as they use Alipay, and in the, in the, in the entire world, the largest financial institution is starting to be Alipay, which is Amazon, coupled with mutual fund and insurance and everything. At M-Pesa in Kenya by 2007, somebody saw that a bunch of people were exchanging mobile minutes on their telephones, and so Safaricom, a phone company, created a way to exchange mobile minutes, which became a form of money. Mobile minutes became a unit of account, a store of value, and a um, medium of exchange. So M-Pesa has over 20 million customers, in Kenya and Tanzania, and it's brought banking, in a sense, to people that were unbanked. And Alipay has four or five hundred million. 
That's how people pay mostly in China. Um, so now we get to Nakamoto Sod. Nakamoto Sod, Halloween night in the middle of the financial crisis, sends an email out to a cypherpunk mailing list. And I said it correctly, cypherpunk. It was an old cryptographer's mailing list where people sort of said, they would talk to each other. These people like David Chom and others would talk about. And the riddle was still a curious thing. How can we solve this? And he starts the email, Halloween evening. I've been working on a new electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer. -peer. That was the goal. Could it be peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third party? In the middle of the financial crisis, we don't need a commercial bank or central bank. I've created something. So what did he or she Satoshi Nakamoto might be a very brilliant computer scientist woman. Um, so here we get into this sort of the nuts and bolts. One is it's multi-party consensus. It's a ledger structure, a bunch of numbers kept in a ledger, just like an accounting ledger, but it has to be amongst multiple parties. We'll come back to that. Two is it's a data structure. It's a data structure of blocks of information. So I just picked pretty colors. I mean, but blocks of information. But the blocks are connected through these little fingerprints. I call it fingerprints. It's a data commitment structure that's cryptography. It's called hash functions. A hash function is a way that you take a lot of data and you put it into an algorithm and it comes out with another number. You take the entire Cary library, all these books, and you'll put, come out with a fixed number. But if you change one page in anything in the Cary library, you'd come out with a different number. So it's a data commitment structure. Um, multiple party consensus, a timestamp depend only log with these hash functions and you end up with an auditable database. It's thought to be tamper resistant. It's tamper resistant because of these, what I call fingerprints or hash functions. Some people would say it's immutable. I, I prefer to say tamper resistant. It's multiple parties. There's no central authority. And it's ultimately a database or a ledger. Any questions? I've probably lost half of you now. Uh, you might get to this. When I first heard about it, I thought, if this is being set up as a parallel monetary structure to the U.S. currency, the federal government would squash it overnight. Well, uh, so the question is, will the federal government squash it? No. But in some countries, they wish to do that, um, but not here in the U.S. But it is a private form of a ledger and a private form of potentially money if it becomes socially acceptable, then it is, is a private form of money. So that competes with the central government's form of money. So some countries have wanted to say, no, we don't want it here. China, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about China, and some other countries have tried to. A Nobel laureate, who happens to be a personal friend of mine, Joe Stiglitz, he knows I teach this course and everything, but Joe Stiglitz has said, the U.S. government should squash it. So you have good company. Joe's a good man, and he's a brilliant economist. But I'm predicting they're not going to squash it, and I'll get to why, I think. Is that? Taxes. All right, taxes. You're, you're saying taxes. Question here. Uh, you, you had that date, October 31st, 2008, right? Yes. Uh, and I was just thinking, September 15th of that year was uh, the Lehman Brothers. Absolutely. This was so in the heart of the financial crisis. Look, we don't know. We, nobody's interviewed Satoshi Nakamoto. But it was right in the epicenter of the financial crisis. Uh, from, from the things Nakamoto-san wrote, it looks like work had been done from at least that spring to summer. But it is an interesting narrative and coincidence, but I don't think it's just a coincidence. I think that's right. Um, and you may use a native token. So I'm going to give you a little bit timestamp depend only logs. The person that invented this were two gentlemen working at Bell Labs. And I'm glad I'm not talking to millennials. You know what Bell Labs is. <laughs> 
Sorry, Candace, you don't know about labs. It's, that's later, we'll tell you. Um, so this gentleman, Stuart Haber, invented, not Nakamoto-san, he invented blockchains because he figured out putting blocks together with time stamping this thing called hash functions. And he started a company in 1995 called Surety, which was a notary company. You can notarize documents, stick them into this company, and once a week he did a data commitment that is still, oops, in the New York Times. Every week in the New York Times in the lost and found section, by the way, this crazy, these crazy numbers, that's a hash. You could notarize the entire Cary Library on surety and it would be a data commitment scheme. So I'm just saying, this didn't all come around in 2008, but Nakamoto-san references Haber and Stonetta. So what has it led to? The crypto markets, it's 245 billion as of this morning when I finished these slides. It may be different now. It's been as high as an $800 billion market. Uh, Bitcoin prices were peaked at 20,000 and now they're at about 7,000 or so. Um, it's not a big asset class. I'll take you a second. What's that? 7722, you were one of the four hands that says you had owned it? Small, small amounts. Small amounts, right. Uh, 7722, <laughs> yeah. Uh, MIT, did you go to MIT? No. All right, all right. Um, how many of you went to MIT? Wow, all right. Thank you. If a Harvard professor were here, would you not come? Or? <laughs> no, just curious. Just no, sorry. This isn't recorded, is it? <laughs> All right. Uh, so it's a highly volatile market, but I do want to say this about this quarter of a trillion dollar asset class. Does anybody want to gander what the, the value of gold is? The worldwide stock of gold. There. 7.8 trillion. This is a good audience. Yeah. I'm not going to deny you your 7.8 trillion because I usually kind of go 8 trillion. But, uh, you know, shame on me for rounding off. 7.8 trillion. So this is an interesting asset class. The worldwide equity markets or stock markets are 10 times what the value of gold. 80, 90 trillion or so. Maybe even 100 trillion these days. Um, so this is a, a lot of people just think this is digital gold. And by the way, gold is a terrific and historical uh, commodity to be money. It's durable. It's hard to, it's, you can d divide it up. It's hard to deny that gold was a good medium of exchange, store of value, and unit of account for thousands of years. But gold has very little value other than that this, it's socially acceptable. I mean, we, you know, wedding rings and things like that, but uh, $7.8 trillion of that stuff called gold. Um, the market is broken down in different sectors. I'm not gonna take time on it, but the biggest sector of this 240 billion is payment tokens like Bitcoin. But then there's a whole slog of, of tokens called platforms. Um, uh, decentralized applications, stable value tokens. It's just to say there's a sophistication in the market, it's starting to be split apart and so forth. Um, so crypto trading, uh, how have you traded your crypto assets? Circle Financial. Through Circle Financial, so over the counter. Yes, exactly, yeah. All right. So there's three different ways you can do it. I could actually sell my Bitcoin to you, or you could sell my, your Bitcoin to me, and we could just arrange that. That would be called peer-to-peer. -peer. The first transaction for Bitcoin was somebody down in Florida. I think it was in the spring of 2010. I, I hope I'm not off, but in May of 2010, put in a message out on the cypherpunk mailing list. Um, would somebody please send me two pizzas? for 10,000 Bitcoin, 10,000 Bitcoin. 
It took five days, and he kept sending messages out every few, you know, first two days later, another day later, and so forth. It's called it's called Pi Day in the Bitcoin community, but it's not it's not March 14th. I think it's May 22nd, but I might be off. I, I'm sorry, gentleman in the back probably knows what Pi Day in Bitcoin. It took five days to get the door and two pizzas, but somebody from the UK electronically, well, he had to pick up a phone and call a Pizza Hut in Florida and send two pizzas. Those 10,000 Bitcoin today would be worth $77 million. Now, in hindsight, those were expensive pizzas. But at the time, it was worth about $37, but he wanted to prove that somebody would do a medium of exchange with pizza. Bitcoin. But you trade with an over-counter desk. I bet you everybody else trades in a crypto exchange. Um, the crypto exchanges, they don't have intermediate access. That means there's no broker-dealer. There's no, I don't know who you all use, but there's no broker-dealer. There's no Vanguard helping you. There's no Goldman Sachs helping you. There's no broker-dealer. Um, it's re probably responsible for 90 or 95 percent of the market, 30 million direct members but that number is probably dated. Um, they're both centralized and decentralized exchanges. But a big thing is, if you're trading with a centralized exchange, which most of you would be, you have to tr transfer your Bitcoin to them. Um, custody. Those four or five of you that have a Bitcoin, how many of you have your own private keys? No? Any of them? Yes. Okay. So one person. What am I talking about? The ownership. You might say, what do I own? You own a little right to a digital code. And the way you express that right is having a private key. You can almost think of it like a password. But a private key, which is randomly generated on your computer, then connects to what's called a public key or a Bitcoin address. If I'm transferring it, I need my private key. Think password. What happens when you lose your password for normal stuff on the computer? What's that? You're locked out. But usually there's some backdoor way. They send you that message and you say, who is the name of your first girlfriend? <laughs> All right, you know, you know. All right, or some of you don't want to use that because you, you know, can't remember or something. But, you know, but it's those types of questions that there's a backdoor way if you lose your password. Here, if you lose your private key, you're, you've lost your asset. That's it. So it's a big problem. You can, you can self-custody, you can keep it on yourself, you can put it on a crypto exchange, and you can use, if you're Fidelity, you can use a big custodian to hold your private key. And in, in an odd sort of way here, there is a cave in Switzerland that a very large company, I shouldn't say large, Zappo is a country from South America that is set up in, in Switzerland. Zappo literally will say, I will store your private key by printing it out on a piece of paper and storing it in a cave in Switzerland. Or I'll keep it on a, on a thumb drive or some sort of computer storage that is not connected to the internet. And it's important that it's not connected so nobody can steal it. That's called cold storage. And they, then they take that and put it in a cave in Switzerland. So, if, the if the cave is flooded, you've lost your asset. <laughs> and there was even a gentleman in Canada that ran a crypto exchange, and he died, unfortunately, from Lou Gehrig's disease last December. The private key was lost. And excuse the expression, but that's really cold storage. <laughs> and Hal Finney, Hal Finney, who many people think might be Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, passed away many years ago, um, and he had his body frozen. So there's all sorts of incredible narratives around here as to whether he did that because they thought he had stored something up here. Um, so all right, I'm going diverting about the crazy stories in this world. Um, so 
Crypto exchanges lose a lot. This is to your question, if it gets flooded. Every one of these exchanges, even Binance, probably the world's largest exchange, was hacked three weeks ago. Somebody stole 7,000 Bitcoin worth 41 million. And if you steal it, what that really means is you're stealing the private key. You're stealing the password, but once the private key is stolen, that's it. And that's the, both the benefit and the burden of a tamper-resistant immutable ledger. It's immutable, but guess what? You steal 7, 000, the private key for 7,000 coins, it's gone. What's that? Well, the question is, does a thief own it? Yeah, yeah. The thief has a private key. Within a few hours, those 7,000 Bitcoin were split up into 25 different transactions and transferred to 25 other private keys with six or eight hours. And you can watch this happen real time on a public ledger. So it's both a strength and a flaw of these systems. It's a remarkable strength that it's tamper resistant, but you, know, you can say whether it's a feature or a bug in that way. Crypto exchanges have a bunch of public policy challenges. They're rife with scams and frauds. They're not regulated. Whether you like regulation or don't regulate, like regulation is an I ran the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And I don't always love regulation even though I was a regulator. I think it's part of, of capitalism's great innovations that in the early 20th century we regulated investment markets. Here in the US in the 1930s, other countries, other decades. But we invest in the markets because we have some confidence that there's some rules of the road. The same way that we put traffic lights on the road or speed limits. These markets are unregulated. They have no traffic lights. They have no speed limits. And it's really in to enforce anything about these markets. They are also markets that as I said, lack intermediated access, which is a fancy word to say they lack brokers. Um, so you're trading right on the exchanges. And they don't necessarily all comply with money laundering laws and terrorism finance. And you may have heard of Silk Road, and there's a kind of interesting narratives about Silk Road in this space. Tax compliance. These exchanges are not sending notices to the IRS about your capital gains. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting you take that and use it. Come April 15th, sir, I hope that you file your taxes and report your gains and losses. But the exchanges are not informing the IRS. In Coinbase, the largest US exchange, the IRS asked for some of their records, and Coinbase said, no. So then Coinbase had to be taken to court by I, the IRS, and they finally, out of like 20 million accounts, they gave the IRS their largest 20,000. So if you're not in the top 20,000, you weren't sent. Um, so we're kind of still in the Wild West right now. Um, you're going, oh gosh, why did I file my taxes? <laughs> you know, no, all right. Um, so that's, I just want you to remember that. Um, smart contracts, what are smart contracts? DAPs and initial point offerings. Well, a smart contract, another computer scientist, Nick Zabo. Some people think that Nick Zabo might be Satoshi. Nick Zabo in 1996 wrote an important paper saying, what if we put computer code to work as if it's a contract? Why don't we put a, a, a conditional clause into the computer code? My dad had a vending machine business, never went to college. He, he, pretty surprised I'm teaching at MIT. But my dad had a vending machine business. Smart contracts are just computer vending machines. The same way that you can go up to a vending machine and put the right number of quarters in it, it's a conditional contractual arrangement. You put a number of quarters in and you get a pack of gum out. That's basically what Nick Sabo said. We can do that in computer code and have conditional uh, arrangements. But you'll hear about blockchain technology that smart contracts are important. And decentralized applications are applications run on a smart contract on top of a blockchain network. So this conceptual framework of decentralization, put some computer code on top of it, my dad's vending machine, so to speak. And there's thousands of them. 
uh, that have been done, about 3,000 as of April per this website. These are public ledgers, so websites can find. So maybe they missed a few hundred, but it's three or 4,000 of them have been done. Well, there's a gentleman, I always like to go back to kind of these narratives, J.R. Willett, never made much money in this. But J.R. Willett kept being interested in Bitcoin in 2009 and 2010, and he wrote a paper with the audacious title, The Second Bitcoin White Paper in 2012. He said, what if, Basically, what if I ask strangers to send money for simply writing a white paper? I'm going to put out on the internet a white paper and say, send me money, I'm going to write computer code and create a new token. And everybody laughed at him, J.R. Willard. And so he finally tried one, he raised a half a million dollars by writing a white paper, he said, send me, what, send me Bitcoin for this concept. But what he did was he invented a conceptual framework that you can raise money as an entrepreneur by asking people for Bitcoin because you were gonna develop another coin. So his concept was, send me Bitcoin, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm gonna develop another coin that has value, and the coins that I'll develop are these kind of smart coins. So what are initial coin offerings? Initial coin offerings, they're not, they're not stock. Its proceeds are used to build a network and they're issued prior to the network being functional. And you might say, what can the network be? The network can be restaurant reviews. The network can be um, a computer code that allows you to share file storage. Or the one that's actually been the most successful, it can be computer code to get little artistic renderings of cats. It's called CryptoKitties. CryptoKitties is one of the most successful token projects ever, where you can basically secure a, a, a digital cat and mate it with another cat. You can change its genders, you can sell the offspring, uh, it's a nice kind of little, kind of clever use of cryptography. By the way, the most expensive cat sold for the equivalent of 117,000 US dollars. Crypto kitties. You might be thinking this is a little bit of a bubble, and maybe it is, but you asked me to talk about it, George, so. Um, so $24 billion has been raised over this period of time but the initial coin offering bubble is sort of bursting a little bit these days. Um, US securities laws, I'm not gonna go through something called the Howey test, but the Howey test is a question of when is something a security? A 1946 Supreme Court case. See, in the 1930s, we included two key words in the securities laws, and those two words are investment contract. So an investment contract because Congress said so, an investment contract is a security. And in 1946, the Supreme Court had to answer the question, when is something an investment contract and thus a security? If you give somebody money in a common enterprise and you're expecting profits based on them, it's an investment contract. Giving somebody money based on their efforts, that's an investment contract. And you're expecting profit based on what they're doing. I think the Supreme Court kind of got it about right. Um, that's gone back to the Supreme Court three or four times as recently about 10 years ago. So they're not like looking to overturn this, this kind of settled law, so to speak. But I think it really comes down to the duck test. You know, if it quacks like a duck, it waddles like a duck, it's an investment contract. And what happened in this world is a lot of people said, I can raise money, $25 billion was raised in these kind of interesting cryptographic digital tokens that may or may not be ever useful to buy restaurant reviews or to, to get file storage. Um, might never be useful, but I can raise money. And they thought they, and they were getting advice from a lot of big law firms that it might not be a security and not be under the securities laws. Jay Clayton, who runs the Securities and Exchange Commission, has basically said, no, this is 
under the securities laws. Um, and um, so that's kind of that bit. How to assess this, crypto economics. Like, how do you basically figure out is any of this worth anything or is it all hokum? Um, so I think of it in three buckets. It's the classic thing. Any business enterprise, what's the value creation proposition? Is it faster? Is it better? Is it cheaper? You know, just basic, like, common sense. You don't need an MIT degree to kind of think this one through. Um, does it lower verification or networking costs? Verification costs because it's tamper resistant, so maybe it lowers the cost of verifying that data. Networking, because it's related to networks. Um, and what's the competitive landscape? And I ask my students always to think what is the traditional data competition and what's the competition inside of blockchain technology. And if somebody is trying to compete with Apple, you better figure out what Apple's gonna do if you try to do something here. There's detailed things about this, but the main thing is, as we go back, the design is multiple party consensus. I have three daughters. To try to talk my daughters in to like, where are we go on vacation? They're all in their 20s. Where are we gonna go on vacation? I don't know, Dad, I haven't talked to my sister. I said, will you please talk to her sister? Like, so there's four of us, that's multi-party consensus. I mean, it's hard enough to figure out where we're gonna go to dinner, but I don't get to see them enough all these days. Where are we gonna go to vacation is hard. This entire area is based on the concept that multi-party consensus, no central authority with this append-only laws, this a little bit complicated ledger structure, and a native token. You've got to have a Venn diagram that those three things make sense, and if they don't, run for the hills and don't invest in it. Like, if you're thinking about it. Unless you just want to be part of a speculative, you know, thing, but you really need to be able to answer those three questions and how they intersect. And then there's trade-offs and performance and so forth. Um, this is a slide I put together based on an economist from the 1930s, but centralization does have cost, and they have the cost of economic rents and capture and single points of failure, but decentralization has a terrible cost of coordination. My three daughters again, how do we decide how to get, can't somebody just, you know, kind of be the authoritarian, not in my household. Um, I think over time the orange line will come down. It will be less uh, costly. If you wanted to create Uber, a ride-sharing app today, you could make an argument if Uber didn't exist. You could make an argument that's a, that we should have a decentralized ride-sharing app. We should have Uber created on a network that's called like Bitcoin. I agree with that. I think it could be an interesting thing. But on the other hand, Uber has spent a lot of money to develop the software to get various cities and various airports to accept their, their ride-sharing uh, app you know, in their community. So it's fully decentralized. Who would have invested the hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to stand that all up around the globe? Because you can go to Zurich or London or Lexington and get a Uber. So when somebody next says to you, this is the greatest thing, let's do it, you have this decentralization, the core issues are centralization versus decentralization. And going back to this slide, this intersection of these three things, multi-party consensus, a little clunkier data structure called append-only logs, and do you really need a native token? Now, I told you I'm not a minimalist. I'm not going to be all the way where my friend Joe Stiglitz is, because I think there are some places that will make sense. Not many. And Bitcoin is like digital gold, so maybe in Venezuela, somebody will want it um, there. Um, so I just wanted to give you a visual as to why I think a lot of this won't make sense. Bitcoin's 140 billion as of last night, but there's all these other payment tokens. So 
does it really make sense to have eight or ten of these things floating around? So maybe two or three. Uh, tokenization is going on, and I'm going to skip through this, but there's a bunch of tokens that represent fiat currency uh, as well. Smart contract platforms. Ethereum is the biggest one, invented by a 19-year-old Vitalik Buterin. All right, he's grown up, now he's 25. <laughs> but Buterin produced this idea that you could build things on top of a new, he called it a worldwide computer, a decentralized distributed computer, the Ethereum network. And it actually works. And CryptoKitties and other things are built on top of it. A couple thousand things are built on top of it. It's slow and it's sluggish, but it is a network protocol for a worldwide shared computer decentralized. But I'm listing like 10 other ones that are competing. I can't even fit. There's 50 to 100 tokens trying to compete to be kind of the next Android or I call it iOS, which is the, the operating system of Apple. So I think this will shake out. The, the, there's gonna be two or three payment tokens, and Bitcoin might be the one, it might not be. There'll be two or three of these platform tokens. Which one, I don't know. Um, is it a catalyst for change? Yes. So, and I, we're almost done here, I promise. Catalyst for change, there's the financial sector. The biggest change so far in the financial sector is in venture capital. 25 or 30 billion dollars was raised for, for these coin offerings. Payment systems around the globe, each of the payment systems around the globe are changing. But if uh, any of you take chemistry when you're, yeah. Remember what a catalyst is? A catalyst is not one of the reactants. A catalyst sort of changes the outcome and actually lowers the amount of energy you need in the system. But I think Bitcoin and digital currencies are basically the innovation is being a catalyst for change to update things. So back to central banks. You asked me about central banks. Central banks around the globe generally offer their payment systems eight hours a day for five days a week, working days. Some now do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but not all. This has made central banks think we've got to update our payment systems. Or in the payment space, if you're doing a remittance from the US to, Ven to I won't pick from Venezuela, let's Philippines. You're doing a remittance and you're going into MoneyGram or others, it could cost you 10% to send that money. So there's a lot of cost in the system and this is just pushing the edge of that envelope like a catalyst to change. And every one of these, there's five or t six big blockchain initiatives and trade finance. There's several initiatives in clearing and settling. I mentioned tokenized securities. And the central banks, the central banks that are looking at changing their payment systems, Central Bank of Canada, the Central Bank of Singapore, are looking at should they use blockchain technology to change their payment system. They're not looking to issue Bitcoin. The only countries looking to actually issue cryptocurrencies are usually countries that are extremists. Venezuela has looked to issue something backed by gold. Iran is looking at things to get around sanctions. Or a country all the way on the other end of the spectrum, Sweden is saying maybe we should do this uh, to uh, have the public have a digital representation of Krona. There was a question. Yeah, so um, you're talking about Bitcoin, but only one of the bullets here tokenized by us is actually sounds like a coin, the other one's like trade finance supply chains, please, so on. Right. You're absolutely right. So the question here is, well, Gensler, most of this doesn't look like cryptocurrency. This looks like just the underlying technology. Um, the underlying technology of blockchain technology. And just to make the distinction, I said three things define blockchain technology. Multi-party consensus and append only log structure, and to the purest, a native token. I'm not a purist, so I apologize. So Bitcoin has all three. 
multi-party consensus. There's about 10,000 computers around the world called nodes that verify and validate the network. Bitcoin has the middle, this kind of append-only log structure, and it has a native token. There's a couple thousand projects that do that. But what's happened, again, a catalyst for change, is IBM and others have said, wait, this is a really interesting thing. What if we do multi-party consensus that is not an open network, but it's a closed private network, and we, we, we get rid of this native token, and we just do multi-party consensus among 21 parties that are signed in in a club, or 17 or 70, but it's a closed permission system and we can still have an append-only log structure. And the gentleman's right. Most of this, in this, and this, and even here, most of the initiatives are permissioned private blockchain. But I still think that it's been a catalyst for change. It's spurring, and I'm not a purist, but, but you're right. Um, some of the things going on in general use, the platforms I talked about, is there really a benefit for decentralized applications? Digital identity. You can actually use this technology. Nobody's doing this, but you could use this technology that all of us could have more control of our identity through something called self-sovereign identity. Because you could have the information there in a tamper-resistant way. Again, this would be using multi-party consensus, append-only logs. You don't necessarily need a native token. Um, so this is to your point. Traditional databases is where all the action is right now. Microsoft Azure and Amazon Web Services, cloud services, or big enterprises, they use traditional databases and you can, you can search them using SQL, which is a, a way to do, that's 99.999% of all databases right now. Permission, private blockchains, is probably where J.P. Morgan and Wall Street and others are looking. The, the third area of public blockchains is, is cryptocurrency. Does that help? No. Um, so what's the path ahead? Good, we're going to get rid of Gensler and close. Um, so the question is, this is the key question. Is this a new layer or not? The internet started in the 70s. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web. We talked about this the secure socket layer. Is programmable money, programmable because of the smart contracts, is programmable money the next layer? Or is this kind of like an interesting thing that, yes, Nakamoto solved the riddle, kind of cool, but is anybody gonna use it? I don't actually know the answer, but I do know this. I do know this, it works. I do know that this kind of innovation from a man or woman we don't know actually is a way to have multi-party consensus in a data structure where you can exchange things of value on the internet without a central authority. So it creates a kind of new tool to possibly do what we've done already. We've already digitized money. Even in this group, less than half of you have used paper cash today. But this is a new way to do that. That's kind of the big open question. Um, I just want to say something about blockchain technology versus the internet. There's a lot of similarities. Open protocols, transport packages of data, applications built on top, and so forth. But I'd say a big difference is blockchains do not work together with each other. And another big difference is this, right at the bottom. The internet took 20 years before money was thrown at it. It started in the 1970s and money started to get thrown in the mid to late 90s. This, if you'd say, started in 2009 and money got thrown at it by 2017 in heaps and bounds. It's a really early technology, but a lot of money thrown at it early. Uh, so where are we? We've gone through a hype cycle in 2013 when Bitcoin peaked at 1,000, but it was a hype cycle about alternative coins. 
We went through a hype cycle around crowdfunding, then the ICO boom, Bitcoin peaked at 20,000. Um, I don't know what the next hype cycle is. I think security tokens and tokenization uh, can tokenize real estate. Some people are saying, well, wouldn't you be able to sell a building if you could put tokens? I say no. I say I think that's not, I think that's hype. But there are people and big companies are putting money behind, what if I could get the investing public to buy a small token of a big building in Singapore or the, or the harbor in Singapore? I call that a real estate investment trust. You can already do that. I don't know why this technology would change that, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of what's next. So how would I conclude? Money is a social and economic construct. We made it up. We humans, our forebears made up the whole thing. And it, it, boy, it's helped us a lot. We've already lived in an age of digital money. Both of those things kind of conflict with each other because Bitcoin can be a money. Cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies provide a peer-to-peer -peer alternative. So always think, do I need to be peer-to-peer -peer rather than centralized? And it addresses verification and networking. Uh, adoption rests in the question of is it truly viable versus a traditional database. But it is competition. It makes you kind of think, well, maybe, maybe there's something there. Um, now, I will say that there'll be a lot of hype and the markets are full of scam. But I do think, lastly, there is some potential. I mean, then again, it's kind of fun to teach at MIT and hundreds of students come to the classes and we have a good time. But I think that there is some potential here. As a disruptive catalyst, maybe not as uh, a final project. So, I don't know how much time or questions, but we've got mics and I'm glad to stay as long as you want uh, um, to chat about this kind of, this area. Oh, oh, I get my money back, huh? <laughs> 50 Swiss francs, and you still have that five dollars. Do you want to read something else? Can you read something from the bottom? Can, can you read something from the bottom left of that? Or, or uh, top, top left? This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. So, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Does anybody know what that means? Do we have any lawyers in the room? So that means we've embedded in our laws, and most countries have, this is, the, is, this is your government giving an advantage to your government's currency. It says, if you have a debt with anybody, they must accept this to fulfill that debt. They must, under the law, fulfill it. So tell me what happens when you walk into Sweet Green, as I did, in New York City the other day, and I'd get my nice little salad, and they wouldn't take cash. <laughs> they wouldn't take cash. Or, Amazon Primes opened up a bunch of stores and they won't take cash. And you know, in Stockholm, there is a lot of stores in Sweden now that will no longer take cash because they don't want to lose it, they don't want the cash registers and things like that. So what does this mean if you walked into Starbucks and you have a, a cup of coffee and they want to take your cash? It means it's free if they don't take it. Yeah. <laughs> By law. Now you try to get that in practice. It's another story. George is a wise man. The thing is, is if they hand you the cup of coffee and the coffee's in your hand, you've established a debtor relationship and you owe them money. They legally have to take it. But if they don't hand you the cup of coffee, you cannot force them to hand you the cup of coffee. <laughs> so you have this little debate after they hand you the salad, is the answer. Questions? Is this process country driven at all or is it just worldwide? Really good question. What, what's, what's the key thing about Satoshi's innovation is it came from a sort of libertarian, off the grid background in the middle of the financial crisis. And it, so it's worldwide 
And what people would call it is censorship. Economists would call it censorship, meaning you can't stop it movement, even kind of if you try. That's worldwide. But then each of 180 or 190 countries have thought about its public policy implications. How to tax it? Is it property or is it currency and how to tax it? Uh, how does it fit into the uh, money laundering rules? In the US, by the way, it's viewed as property, not currency. The US Department of Treasury and the IRS said that years ago. But for money laundering rules, the same US Treasury had to say it was currency. It's not currency for tax purposes, but for the Bank Secrecy Act that didn't anticipate any of this, so they say fudged a little, they called it virtual currency. So every country's got it and has kind of established, you know, some set of rules, but it's very new and very open. Uh, you use the term ledger to describe the operation of the technology. I'm an old school person. To me, a ledger is a book where it's centralized in an office where every, everything is kept at one point. Now, you also said that some of this is decentralized. Could you please explain that? Sure. So let me dichotomy? do the, the two pieces. Ledgers, which go back thousands of years, and written numbers came about before written words, it is thought. And if you look at the old tablets, cuneiform, or early ledgers. Ledgers are the, the, the gentleman's, what's your first name? Alan. Alan. Absolutely right. Ledgers are about recording, uh, usually numbers, but recording transactions. And you can have a transaction ledger, or you could have an account ledger. But they don't have to be centralized. That's one thing I would differ with you about. They usually are, but they don't have to be centralized. So blockchain technology and using Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a worldwide ledger that currently has about 60 million open transactions. They're called unspent transactions. And those 60 million are kept in a ledger, in essence. But it, that ledger is on 10,000 different computers. So rather than being in one central place, the ledger is a de decentralized ledger because it has multiple copies. W multiple copies of a ledger give you something really valuable as tamper resistance and some security, but they come with a cost because it's hard to coordinate, and that's the economic trade-off. Does that help? So the government can print money, any, any amount of money. Why can't the person who came up with Bitcoin had generate more Bitcoins and just pocket the money? So the, it's a really, is this working out? The really good question is that <coughs> central governments can not only print money, but they can debase money. Back to Roman times, it was called coin clipping. You would take a little gold and silver out of the coin and each Caesar as they came along, they were, and this is true in Roman history. So governments can debase currencies, they can also print money, hyperinflation, so forth. Uh, the same thing can happen on these, but this is written into code. So Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto decided that coins would be issued approximately every 10 minutes at a certain, um, regularity, and for four years it started at a certain issuance of 50 tokens, 50 coins uh, every 10 minutes. Now, years later, it's 12 and a half coins. Programmed into one for eternity into the system, how these would be issued. So it's, it's, it's basically a monetary policy for inflation that's hard-coded into a protocol. And then you might say, well, what if somebody wanted to change it? You can change the Bitcoin protocol, the Ethereum uh, protocol has been changed a number of times and the monetary policy has been changed. It takes, in essence, back to this word, a consensus among all of the different operators on the node. So if there's multi-party consensus, you can change the monetary policy. Without that, you can't. So to answer your question, humans, 
can get together through our central bank, j Powell, running, you know, central, the Federal Reserve, and as you say, issue more currency. This, it takes the operators, humans, again, of many computers who have different economic interests, if they wanted to vote, in essence, through a consensus mechanism, they could change it. Otherwise, it's generally hard-coded into the computer. What's that? No, oh, oh. Very good question. Does it take 100%? It's a little nuanced. Um, what can happen is if 51%, remember there's blocks, blocks of data, blocks of data, blocks of data. If 51% want to change something, 51% can, and those blocks will grow on whatever is the consensus mechanism. But if the minority wants to continue the, the chain and not adopt the new rule, you will have what's called a fork, F-O-R-K, fork, in the community. This has happened three or four times in Bitcoin. It's happened in a big, important way in Ethereum. And so there's two Ethereums, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, like you can think like Coke. Coke, wasn't there with that little time. And Bitcoin has uh, like four different Bitcoins. But the majority, the 51%, if they go with a different inflation rate or something, it's gonna have the most community around it. And, and at least to date, it usually then has the highest market value, but just because people are backing it. So I know it's more nuanced. I believe that three or four years ago, all incoming freshmen at MIT were given $50 in Bitcoin. Is this true? And the idea was to see what they did with it, how they spent it. Am I wrong? So the only thing you're mistaken on, I think it was more than the freshmen, I think it was all the undergrads. Okay. And it was a little bit longer than three years ago, but Jeremy Rubin, who was a student, came up with this idea. <laughs> And they found somebody to fund it, and it cost about a half a million dollars, so it had to be a little bit earlier than three years ago. But it was a remarkable sort of thing because it's a public ledger, ledger, the gentleman who Alan left, but it's a public ledger, and you could see how it propagated and what the students did. You didn't know the student's name because it was this cryptographic Bitcoin, but yes, and uh, papers were written about it. I think it was. 2013 or 2014. Jeremy's a wonderful individual. Uh, Excuse me, so, so what did they do? Good. You know, I, it's a good question. I wish I, 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 I hadn't gone back and read it. It was basically this, most of them sold it. I don't think there's any <laughs> knowledge of what, but they got this like, and some of them lost their private keys for sure. Right, because it was worth, uh, how many undergrads are there? Uh, what's that? 4,000, so, you know, it's not much different, a half a million dollars over 4,000, so, you know, they didn't get much of it, and they're good MIT students, but I'm sure some of them probably just lost the private key, too. Um, yeah, I am from the biopharmaceutical side, and it looks like blockchain has, like you said, a ledger that's appendable, it's a long chain. Um, I'm used to DNA sequencing and things like that. So if you go from point to point, does that blockchain terminate or does it continue? Like somebody buys and then right. converts it right. back to USD. So there's a chain to that point for that somebody. Okay, I, I understand. So the question is basically, um, we talked about blocks of data. What happens when you sell something? Uh, Bitcoin right now has about 580,000 blocks in its 10-year history. And because of the data commitment scheme, if you change anything in the whole block chain of 580,000 blocks, it will come out with the wrong hash. Remember I talked about this library, you know, all being put into a hash function. So your question is, how are transactions tracked? Because in a block of data, there's 
a lot of transactions. Currently, it's running between 2,000 and 2,500 transactions in any block. And what Satoshi came up with is the sequencing, to use your word, is if I want to move something from me to you, I have to spend one of my transaction outputs that I have. Let's say it was one Bitcoin. And now I'm only going to send you a half of Bitcoin because I don't want to give you $7,700. I'm going to give you half of that. I put a transaction command in, in script code, to give you half and to send the other half back to my key. So I've just retired completely that output and I've created two new outputs, the half that I just got and you have one, the other half. So the way that Satoshi sort of did that is that way. But if you want to see any, the validity, the validity of the half token that you got, you can go back and computers can do it very quickly through 580,000 blocks and it could go from you to me and then maybe I got it a year ago and it can validate all the way back to what's called the Genesis block. So that, that's a lot of detail, but I hope that helps. Um, my question is about the speed of uh, settling the transaction. Is this is your question or somebody else's question? Well, so I'm, I done a quick search. Bitcoin 78 minutes to settle, Ethereum 6 minutes. So, um, is there any reason why it takes so long? Maybe is there any technology that is similar but uh, settles quicker? And the second part is how much energy they spend to do the settling because how much energy? Energy. I got it. I, I I said, got it. Yeah. Okay. Two good questions. So Satoshi Nakamoto created this algorithm. I mean, who knows? At the beginning, to every ten minutes, roughly, it's probabilistic, but every ten minutes there'd be a new block of data. And so if you do a transaction, if I sent you the half coin in a block, one of the questions is, is it settled? The word settlement in finance means that you've legally transferred property ownership with finality, that you can't come back. Think of the word final. In, in the social normative sense, in the Bitcoin community, the feeling is one block isn't enough. We need to start appending more blocks to that. And many people think six blocks are about an hour. That means it's not going to be messed with, with the 51% of the chain saying, Ethereum produces a block every about 14 seconds. They're much smaller, less, well, they're not necessarily smaller, but they're different mechanisms. Second part of your question is, is anybody thinking about doing it differently? Yes, a lot of people are trying to do it much faster and have higher performance. Sylvia McCallie, who's a Torrent Award winner at MIT, has a company called Algorand, and he's a mathematical whiz, so And he's come up with a whole sort of set of algorithms that you can have high performance and hundreds of thousands of transactions a second and so forth. But he trades off, and he might disagree, but he trades off some centrality to get that performance. And Vitalik Buterin says you can't get security and performance. And there's a trilemma about centrality and performance. It's you know, kind of there. Third question is energy. Let me ask three questions. The third question is energy. To secure the worldwide Bitcoin network, and this work was done a few months ago, so it might be different takes about the amount of electricity it does to, to power the country, uh, the homes in the country of Austria. It was about a quarter of 1% of the worldwide electricity use. So many people, as some of you are shaking your head, go, wow, that seems like a lot of electricity. But it may not be It is a lot of electricity, but it may not be a bug, it might be the feature. It's basically what it costs to secure this network. But to secure a $140 billion network, to take that much electricity, this doesn't scale. This could not be 10 or 20 or $50 trillion dollars to replace the world currency and secure it, because the math would say it would take half the world electricity. 
But I would remind you, it's really hard to mine gold. And one of the great features of gold is it's hard to get it out of the ground, to find it, to get it out of the ground. And horrible things have been done in history to get gold. I mean, slavery, and all sorts of bad things. But one of the features about gold is it's really hard to mine, and it secures the value of it. And the yap stone, the rye stone and yap, was hard to quarry because it was quarried on an island 200 kilometers away. So it's a feature and a bug, I just want to say. So we have time for one more question. <laughs> yes, so oh I have a- God, the library's gonna kick this out. <laughs> a very simple question. Uh, who are these operators and what do they get out of operating these nodes? Uh, the question is about the nodes. Two answers. Mining, if you're mining Bitcoin, you're running a computer and trying to find the next block. It's cryptograph. There's a puzzle. I did not dive into what's proof of work. Proof of work is caught. But you have to run a computer to try to find the solution to, a, people call it a puzzle, but it's really about finding a number that completes the hash function. They get a block reward. Right now they get 12 and a half tokens, which are roughly worth 100,000 US dollars. 12 and a half times 8,000, roughly speaking. The miners are worldwide, but most of them are in China. And about 50% of the mining is going on in China. Whether it's because there's cheap electricity, whether it's because it's corruption and they're paying local authorities for cheap electricity, which is another form of cheap electricity, or whether it's to avoid capital controls in China where you're taking RemMD, buying electricity, converting the electricity on a random basis to Bitcoin and selling the Bitcoin for dollars, I can't tell. But what miners get is block rewards. What the nodes get if they're not operating as a miner is they're securing the network because they might own some Bitcoin and they're just validating, they're validating the network. So you can operate a node and not be a miner. So it's a little bit, you might say that seems like a hard thing to maintain. If, if they're not, I think they're doing it both as hobbyists and because they uh, own some Bitcoin. Securing their, you know, value. But you could be a free rider, not operate a node as an economic man. George actually has one more question. George, the please. Uh, I think I'm the end of the journey here. I'd like to hear. I hope not. I'd like to hear a comment uh, about uh, sovereign adoption of this technology, uh, replacing the independent, if you will. And, and the role of the federal banking, the Federal Reserve of each country in terms of monetary policy and being able to manage economic disruption. So I think, and this is a prediction, I think that this will spur changes in payment systems. It doesn't quite, I'm gonna take your question three parts I recognize. Payments. Mo a payment is just simply at this point moving a digital representation of money from one person's sub-ledger to somebody else's sub-ledger. From my Bank of America sub-ledger, I, I bank at Bank of America, to George's, wherever you bank. That payment system, which is moving ledger balances, I think this technology is spurring some change already. And I think that the sovereigns will kind of embrace it, but slow, slow. I think in terms of the currency itself, the store of value, if you wish. The payment is medium of exchange, in a sense. But the currency, the store of value, I think most sovereigns will say, no, we're not gonna have this. However, I think uh, two things are happening. In some country in the next 10 years, 
they will go to a digital representation of tokenized central bank money because nobody will be using the paper stuff anymore. And Sweden's the closest. Sweden's the, the oldest central bank in the world is from Sweden, from the 17th century. And they're the closest saying, maybe we need to do this. But the strategic issue is, do they want to do it in lieu of their commercial banks? I think of commercial banks like McDonald's franchisees. Commercial banks are basically representing the central bank. Again, bear with me. The central bank is the producer of the hamburgers and the recipe. And commercial banks have a franchise arrangement that they, they really are the ones that print money. Commercial banks print money. They're called bank deposits. The central bank of Sweden has to decide whether they want to disintermediate their franchisees called commercial banks. That's a big strategic question, and most central bankers say, no, we don't want to do that. But I think Sweden's the closest. But if, I think in 10 years, and I've said this when I meet in these central bank forums that sometimes I'm invited to, I said, don't think somebody, 190 countries, somebody's going to do this. Somebody, somewhere. And then there's countries and extremists. Venezuela, sorry. But countries and extremists. And every five or 10 years, some country gets hyperinflation, and every 20 years, they kind of completely lose control of their currency. I don't know which one's going to be next. We're all old enough to know that it's happened somewhere. And the question is, will their public, not their government, will their public turn to either Bitcoin or one of these variations, a stable value token, and use it. When Ecuador lost control of its currency, it basically, its public turned to the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar is accepted in a lot of countries that have lost control of their currency. And I'm sure in Venezuela, they probably... No. The, on they the are street. taking their own money. It's called Petro. Peso. All Petro. right. That's but my that's my end to that question is, I think some sovereign at some point in time might recognize an extremist that their public is just using this stuff called Bitcoin or something else, and the coffee shops are accepting it, and somebody starts paying, because the close is, money is just a social construct, and we already live in a digital age. So will some public in a country that's lost control of its currency turn to. That's a question mark. But, you know, history takes interesting turns. So I thank you. You've been very gracious. You've been very